Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study tonight. We thank you because of the revelation of your truth, which always bring in our way. We're asking, Lord, that today your word will be made clear, made plain to every heart in Jesus' name. And we're asking, O oh Lord, that as you are reminding us day after day, week after week, we pray that these words will remain in our hearts and will be established in the truth in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that the wind of false doctrine and a wind of deception blowing in the country and blowing in this continent and all over the world will not blow us away from our steadfastness in Jesus' name. That your purpose of sending the word to every one of us every week as we come like this, that purpose will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. And your spirit will remind us every time there's temptation, every time there is deception, every time there is a likelihood, a danger of being drawn away from our steadfastness, your spirit will remind us of all these things that we're hearing and will take note of your word, the planted on the solid rock. And never be moved away from the truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we pray that in this church, you give both pastor and members, leaders, everyone in this church, that steadfastness, that faithfulness, to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Help us to keep on standing until the very end, so that when you will come, You'll still find us faithful, loyal, obedient to your word. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We're making progress in our study of the Bible. We're now in 2 Peter. And now we are in the last chapter, which is a chapter 3. Actually, as you look at the whole chapter, you will see there is emphasis here on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the implication of that for the believer and for the church of the living God. Of course, I'm sure you know that Second Peter itself, as an epistle, was written to the believers so that they'll be able to stand first in the truth, in the doctrines of the Word of God. Actually, as you look at uh, First Peter, you will see that the Christians were undergoing persecution and trials, trials of fire, that Peter the Apostle needed to encourage them, and so he wrote First Peter unto them. By the time they began to write the uh, second Peter, that is the second epistle of Peter uh, to the believers, the believers now were facing another problem. And it was a problem of false teachers and false prophets and deceivers and scoffers and scorners and doubters and unbelievers going against the watch of God. And they were not just arguing privately, but publicly they were arguing against the watch of God, inspired of God, the infallible watch of God, and the prophecy in particular of Christ coming again. That's why Peter, used of God, inspired by the Spirit of God, had to write to the believers saying they should not allow anything or anyone to make them go astray from the word of God. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, see ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also been led astray when the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. And you will see then the purpose and the goal, the aim of the apostle. He didn't want the believers to be led astray, to be blown away from the sound teaching of the word of God, and in particular, the prophecy of the coming of Christ. The main emphasis of this chapter was to remind and reassure the believers of the certainty of Christ's second coming. The certainty of Christ's second coming. Don't we need to have that same assurance and reassurance today and remind ourselves today? Because you see, in the many churches and us, the emphasis is no more on the coming of Christ. The emphasis is on your personal need, either to get married or to have children or to be healed, or to be delivered, or to have a job, or to have the present 
physical, material blessings of the time and of the day. Check up from any church today. Whether it is the Orthodox Church or the Evangelical Church or the Pentecostal Church, the emphasis is no more on preparing for the coming of the Lord. The emphasis is just the immaterial things of this life. And even in the special programs, whether you call them pastor's programs or single programs or couple's programs or believer's program or professional business and men's business program or whatever programs the churches are having as a special kind of role and function, the emphasis is not on the coming of the Lord. The emphasis is on deliverance and the emphasis is on healing. Ah, we're going to have the blessings of this life. And the church is fast forgetting the certainty of Christ coming. In fact, uh, the church does not even think about it anymore. I mean, the church at large. Because that is not the focus of their faith and of their belief. And at such a time like this, when it appears, the bride is forgetting the bridegroom. And the church is forgetting the hedge of the church. And the church is no more waiting and expecting for the coming of their Lord. At such a time like this, we need to remind one another again, reassure one another again, the certainty of Christ's second coming. Unbelievers, doubters, scoffers, they had not only expressed their doubt concerning Christ's return privately, they had begun to boldly argue publicly against that sure prophecy and the scoffers argued and objected to the doctrine and the prophecy that the lord jesus will return to this world and that the present earth will be destroyed this and scored at the prophecy and possibility of the creation of the new heavens and the new earth scoffers and apostates they are and the aim at overthrowing the faith and the steadfastness of true believers. That's the reason why the Lord used Peter and the Spirit inspired him that he will remind the Christians so that they will not become like the foolish virgins. Because many times when we become like foolish virgins, we don't even recollect that our Lord is coming again. And we do not make the necessary preparation. That's what Jesus Christ said. That's the reason why Jesus Christ many, many times, over and over and over again, that you should watch. Because you know not the day, nor the hour, wherein the Son of Man cometh. And the tendency of today, and the preaching of today, and the religious worship of today, and the services of today, and the seminars of today, and the programs of today, and all the things surrounding people today, they do not remind us to watch. They make us careless. And they make us concentrate on material things of the present day. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. As I said, I've written the first epistle to you. I'm writing the second epistle to you. In both of those epistles, there is something I'm doing. I'm stirring up your pure minds by way of remembrance. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before, of the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. He said, that you will not forget. The scoffers will come, and some of them know how to talk. But everything is chaff, that they just roast with honey. It might appear sweet. It doesn't have vitamin. It will not give you spiritual strength. It might look appealing, but it doesn't purge you and prepare you for the coming of the Lord. And therefore, you will still be mindful of the words and the warning of the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament. And these are the servants of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please be watchful and please be mindful. Because all these people that are roaming about as scoffers and unbelievers and false prophets and false teachers, they come to deceive you and they make you to forget. They make you to forget the essential thing, which is readiness and preparation for the coming of the Lord. In verse 3, it says, knowing this false, that there shall, be, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own laws. Actually, when you think of the last days and you look at the last days, see what Jesus said. That when his coming is approaching, that in the last days, 
Iniquity shall abound. Iniquity will multiply. It appears that even a kind of sin, a kind of iniquity that was not there before is being invented. And the love of many shall wax cold. And you know that when, so if, if you appear warm and hot, and then you're put side by side with someone cold, I'm sure you know that when you take that uh, iced fish out of the fridge or the freezer. And then you put it side by side with another fish that looks warm, that you have roasted or baked or cooked. And you put them together. The hotness or the warmth of that fish will not make the other one warm. But the coldness of that one from the freezer will make the warm one to be cold. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Error has a way of influencing the people that were standing on the truth, that they do not stand on that truth anymore. These coffers will come, and they'll be walking in their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? We're talking about coming of Christ, coming of Christ. They're not telling us how to educate our children. They're not telling us how to build houses. They're not telling us how to get married. They're not telling us how to get healed. They're not telling us about deliverance. They're not telling us how to break generational causes. They're not telling us how to enjoy life for the present day. They're telling us about, you know, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Is that what we're going to be waiting for? Where is the promise of his coming? After all, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That was their argument. And that was the thing they were using to deceive the people that ought to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. That's why we're looking at this study today. Warnings against scoffers in the last days. Warnings against scoffers in the last days. We divide the study of these four verses to three parts. Number one, remember. Number two, recognize. Number three, reject. Number one, you remember the sure word of Christ's servants. Those prophets and those apostles, those are Christ's servants. Number two, recognize the sinful walk of the scoffers. Recognize the sinful walk of the scoffers. Then number three, reject the subtle wiles. Uh, wiles, that means the cleverly presented error and deception. You, they, they wrap it up in such a way that you will not know it is error. Their argument will seem logical, will seem reasonable, will seem convincing that you will not know it is error. When Satan went to Eve through the serpent, Eve did not know it was all error, it was all deception, that it will make them to lose the glory of God upon their lives. It will be so clever. The wiles, subtle wiles of the scoffers. Come back to number one. Remember, the sure word of Christ's servants. In Second Peter chapter 3, I'm reading to you from verse 1, this second epistle. Beloved, I write unto you. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you. Look up here. Peter counted these believers as precious and beloved because they belong to Christ. But he knew that when something is precious, everybody is looking for that thing. And when these believers, the lambs and the sheep of the fold of Christ, as precious as they were, as important as they were, Priced and priceless as they were to the Lord Jesus Christ, the enemy will be after them. Because the enemy too, the enemy wants, you know, those precious things, those beloved people. That's what you need to re recognize in your life. And many of us, we don't understand that. That when you are precious in the sight of God, when you are beloved in the sight of God, and when you have some treasure within you, the enemy too will be looking for you. Because with your intelligence, with your loyalty, with your faithfulness, if the enemy could get you, it would be an advantage to their own cause. And so Peter recognized, because Jesus Christ has said, Lovest thou me more than all these years, I love you, Lord. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Three times he told him to feed his people. 
And because of faithfulness to that, Peter now was telling these people, Beloved, I'm writing unto you. If there is anything a preacher can do, if there is anything a pastor can do, if there is anything a servant of the Lord can do, it's not to entertain you, it's not to smile at you, it's not to just shake hands with you, it's not to give you bread and butter, it's not to give you physical things, it's to write unto you, speak unto you, it's to counsel you, it's to teach you and prepare you for the coming of the Lord. And that's what Peter was doing. And you know there are many people that don't appreciate the teaching of the Word of God today. Eh, he knows how to talk. He knows how to teach. I write unto you. Only distributing tracts. Only giving us books. Only giving us cassettes on holiness. But, hey, but we say we're looking for healing. We say we're looking for food. We say we're looking for money to educate our children. But what he gave them, what will last them for eternity, what will prepare them for the coming of the Lord? That's why he said, I'm writing unto you. Here is what I'm doing. In both of those epistles, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. I wonder whether everybody, coordinators, group coordinators, overseers, pastors and preachers, whether we still cherish this weekly Bible study. Oh, we knew all that before. We knew the doctrines before. We knew the teachings before. And since we know those things, since we knew those things before, you know, let those new people, those young people, those new converts, let them go. They need it. Ah, we remember. When we were learning those simple, simple fundamental things, foundational things, you know, we used to run to the Bible study. But now that we know everything, why do we need to worry anymore? This paper, he said, I'm stirring up your pure minds by way of remembrance. You knew that before. I'm going to teach you again. That's why it's very important for all our leaders, all our workers, to always be present at the Bible study. Lagos say we are soon going to be taking attendance uh, in, the, in the sense that we're going to be checking up coordinators and group coordinators and zonal leaders and women reps and women coordinators and key workers that are not attending the Bible study. I will, might have to do something about it and tell them, we want you to feed your soul and get prepared for the coming of the Lord. Before you say that you are a leader, don't just carry post and position without preparing yourself for the coming of the Lord. You knew those things before, but we need to remind you, by way of remembrance, was stirring up their pure minds. In verse 2 it says that that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, that you will be mindful of the words we have spoken, of the teachings we have given, of the doctrines you have learned, of everything that you have received before, you gird them, you preserve them, you keep them, you watch over them jealously so that the people of the world will not take it away from you. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 12 and verse 13. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, that is these prophets of the Old Testament time, but that unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven with things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, get up your, the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It was his desire that they will remember. But he was telling them that these words were the words spoken by the holy prophets in the Old Testament and also the commandments of the servants of Christ and the apostles of Christ in the New Testament. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, but well, they were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. I mean, first Peter. Now in second Peter, in second Peter chapter one, I read verse 12, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Although you know them, are you established in the present truth? 
yet I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance. You know, and there are some people that all they want to be preaching, all they want to be teaching, all they want to be ex explaining, and new, new things. They don't want to repeat what the people have heard before. They want to always get a new subject, a new topic, a new, a new whatever, discovery or revelation. But he said, I'm putting you in remembrance of these things. Although you knew them before, and you are even established in the present truth. In verse 13, yeah, I think it me, it's suitable. I think it fit. As long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Putting you in remembrance. Then in verse 19, we have also a sure word of prophecy. Sure word, sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's what he's telling us about this coming of the Lord that we need to remember. And it wasn't only Peter reminding us or telling us to remember. Even Jude, in Jude verse 17. Jude verse 17. But beloved, remember. How we are apt to forget. We have the danger of forgetting. That's why these important things we need to remember. And how do we forget things? One, if nobody talks about it anymore, then we'll forget. If we don't go back to those things anymore, we ourselves, then we forget. And if we don't remind our children, we don't tell our children about the coming of the Lord, then we forget. If all we're teaching our young people, our students, our teenagers, is be successful in life. Make it in life. Climb the ladder of success. God has made you the head and not the tail. Study. Get a certificate. Be professional and do something in this life. If all you are emphasizing to your children is success, 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 passing exam, and you do not remind them of the coming of the Lord, those children will be blank. They will not know anything about the rapture, about the great tribulation, about the coming of the Lord, about the marriage supper of the Lamb, and about the, about, uh, the, the, the great white throne judgment, and about heaven and hell, about the things established in the word of God. You yourself, you will forget, and your children will know nothing about it. Don't just talk about success, success, success. This world will end one day. Not only that, what shall it profit your children? What shall it profit the youth? If they gain the whole world and they lose their own soul, what shall a teenager give in exchange for his own soul? That's the reason that we need to remind our children and remind everybody and remind the married people. Children, children, children. We want children. We want children. We want children. The only thing they pray about, wanting children. No readiness and preparation for the coming of the Lord. We need to remember that Christ is coming and there is some Something more important than getting children, getting wife, and getting the material things of this life, it is to remember that Christ is coming and get prepared. In Jude verse 17, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, if you remember this, you will not backslide. If you remember this, you'll not be running about looking for ephemeral, superficial, bubbles, mirage of life. If you remember this, you will know that the most important thing, the most essential thing is to be ready when the Lord shall come in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Preachers, leaders in the church, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things that nobody else is talking about, that uh, the, the churches out there are not talking about, and the conferences out there are not emphasizing, if you will understand that this is the real essential thing, preparing the people of God for the coming of the Lord. And if thou, brethren, if you put 
in remembrance the brethren of these things thou shalt be a good minister of jesus christ nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained if you are going to do that it tells you what to do in verse 15. meditate upon these things give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in them continue in them continue in them the possibilities they are to be swept off our feet because of this erroneous wrong emphasis and what people are looking for and they don't care whether they miss the rapture whether they miss heaven if they just get the material things of the present day but take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine continuing them for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee and that's the word the Lord is giving us because if we are not careful, we'll forget. Not only that the preachers are even reminding us, they are sent the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit too will keep on reminding us. In John chapter 14, John chapter 14 verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you whatsoever i said unto you part of what he said is that he'll come with the clouds of heaven the holy ghost will remind you will bring to your remembrance whatsoever i said unto you part of what he said is that in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and take you unto myself so that where i am there you will be also that's part of what he said the holy ghost will remind us will put us in remembrance of what he has said unto us and if we do not allow the holy spirit to remind us and the preachers don't remind us and we ourselves don't read about it how are we going to get ready we need to remember now see what is said matthew chapter 24 matthew chapter 24 reading from verse 35 matthew 24 verse 35 heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away but of that day and hour no is no man no not the angels of heaven but my father only also how foolish some people could be how ignorant some people could be how wise some people could be how unintelligent some people could be just a few years ago in a particular place somebody prophesied and gave a date when the lord will come and those people that are supposed to be intelligent, that are supposed to read just one verse of the Bible, but of that day and hour, no as no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Those people, just to read one verse, and it will clear them from the error. Some of them abandoned their houses and they bought this and that. They said great revelation was coming. Jesus was coming at this very time. And when the date passed, they were disappointed. And they still keep on going to that church. Well, that's overseas, but even here, in a town not far away from here, a particular group, a particular prophet and prophetess, they came together and they, they also said that this particular time, just less than about two years ago, that Jesus Christ was coming. They were very sure. And the parents withdrew their children from school and they stopped all their businesses and rounded up everything, getting ready that the Lord was coming. And they gave them the exact date. That date has come and gone. And those people now, they are regretting just to read the bible and if they read the bible and read this verse nobody will be able to deceive them that's why we're reminding ourselves here that deceivers are all around and then in verse 37 but of that but as the days of noah were so shall also the coming of the son of man be for us in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage isn't that what people want today just tell us how to have more food. We're hungry. Just tell us how to have eating and drinking, merriment and ceremony and feasting. Just tell us how to get money and how to take care of ourselves and take care of our families. Isn't that all that the people are running after today? All these new, new churches, what's the emphasis? Prosperity, money, job, material things, eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage. Ah, you stay in that uh, church? All they talk about is salvation, is holiness, getting ready for the coming of the Lord. Are you married yet? And uh, you've been going to that church, going to that church. Holiness, holiness. Second coming of Christ, rapture. 
And since you got married how many years now, where is the child? Have you been pregnant uh, from one morning till evening before? And you just stay there? Only holiness, holiness, second coming of Christ? And eventually, some of these people say it's true. If we just stay on this holiness, holiness, second coming of Christ, and there is no child, when I see the children of other people, it brings sorrow in my heart. So they approach themselves and they go in search of children. And that's the totality of their Christianity today. And this is what happened just before the flood came upon the world of that time. It said they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Then it says at the latter part of that verse, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not. And they knew not. And they knew not. It took them by surprise. They were not getting ready. They were not even watching. They didn't believe all that. All they wanted was the material things of the world. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That's the reason we are saying all this and reminding ourselves Christ is coming. Don't be blown away by the error of the people that put all the emphasis on material, material things. In Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 from verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men, actually they were angels, stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven remind yourself that these were the words not of men but of angels that they same jesus that you have seen going up into heaven he will come again in like manner himself he will come to take his saints away and for you to be ready it will mean that you are holy and righteous in first john chapter 2 First John chapter 2, verse 28. First John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him. Little children, stay where you are. Abide in him. Little children, abide in his word. Little children, that salvation you have got, don't let anybody take it away. Abide in him. Little children, if you have hope that you want to see him at his coming, this purity of heart, this holiness of life, this sanctification of our nature, abide in him. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 11. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast that thou hast, that no man take thy crown. I pray nobody will take your crown. Uh, the, the devil is cunning and very, very clever. Uh, you find, uh, you know, some believers who have been so loyal and faithful and devoted, and the Lord preparing something wonderful for them. And even the, you know, the, the blessings they're looking for, and these people, they forget the word of God. You think about Abraham. And he waited for 25 years. But he was just following the Lord. Walk before me and be thou perfect. How about the child? You said you'll give me. Walk before me and be thou perfect. How about the inheritance? Who am I going to give all this inheritance to? Leave that. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Zechariah and Elizabeth just serving the Lord, serving the Lord until old age. When they were younger, they had been praying for children. The children did not come. All right, if the children do not come, no big deal. Just, just serve the Lord. And when they had even forgot him, as if maybe no child will come anymore, then the angel came and said, Your prayers have now come in memorial before the Lord. Those are people of God. They didn't forsake God because of not having the material things of this world very quickly. How oh, is it that we are forgetting the word of God? And we are running after all these uh, prayer houses and prayer sheds. And we don't care whether they use uh, palm oil or granite oil or whatever. Whatever they use, it doesn't matter. Just give me children. Remember, hold fast that which you have that nobody will take your crown. I come to point number two. Recognize the sinful work of the scoffers. Recognize the sinful work 
of the scoffers. Actually, if you remember the words of Jesus Christ, it will not be too difficult to keep yourself in the faith and in the truth. Because he said, you will know them by their fruits. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Knowing this first, if you forget any other thing, knowing this first, if you don't remember all the other references that you have learned, knowing this first, and when your mind has the tendency to go astray, the very first thing that you ought to know, knowing this first, when the people of the world, when they are putting pressure on you, and your mind and your heart is yielding to that pressure, knowing this first, when the arguments of the people of the world is having hold and effect on you, you graduated the same year with so and so, see where he is up there, see where you are down here, knowing this first. We're walking here in this church. Other people are walking in other churches. Look at their condition up there. Look at our condition down here. When the pressure and the argument of those people of the world will want to catch you, knowing this first. Uh, were it not for this coming of the Lord, coming of the Lord, holiness, holiness, and you didn't know what the people do to get a job and what the people do to get contract, you would have done this. Have, see, see that other person going to that other church. See that other person going to that other church. You are in the same kind of business. See how he's progressing. See where you are today. Knowing this first. Didn't you get married the same time when so-and-so got married? Did they not do the wedding in the same district, in the same locality with you? How many children uh, you know, do they have now? Don't they have three or four? How many have you got now? Uh -huh. When that is able, it's about to have pressure on your mind, on your heart, knowing this first, you know, all those other things you think you know, you think you want to know, they're not the essential things. They're not the most important things. They're not the priority there is something for us you need to concentrate upon. And you know, even those of us who are here, even myself as I'm standing here, and they, they, they ask me questions in other places, and sometimes the devil would like to make you sad. And they asked, you know, some people came over here to the country, and they asked a particular church because uh, that other person, they wanted to have a big program, they wanted to have this and that. And they asked, uh, you know, that other church, they said, do you know so and so referring to me of deeper life? And that other church said, no, we don't know that man. Do you know about his church? No, we don't have information about his church. And eventually when I got to that country and uh, they, were, uh, they were talking to, they said, do you know so and so? I said, I know him. What does he do? I said, oh, he's a, he's a respectable pastor. He comes up in the newspapers. Everybody knows him in Nigeria. He has big, big programs. Oh, you know him, but he doesn't know you? <laughs> the temptation is there to run him down, to also destroy him because he wasn't there. They were asking me about him and about those people. And they wanted to give them some opportunities. And they wanted to check up for me to know whether... He's a reputable person, popular. I said that man is popular. Everybody knows him. Everybody knows his church. Has big, big programs. But they said they don't know you. I said, I, I'm surprised about that. I said, don't, don't worry about that. They may not know me, but I know them. The temptation is there. For you to build up yourself and to become proud and to retaliate. That since they said that about me, here is my chance. They wanted to ask me so that they can give them an opportunity to do something big. I'm, I'm going to run them down to you. Don't do that. Knowing this first, there's something we know. We're preparing for the coming of the Lord. We're not fighting with anybody, struggling with anybody to have this opportunity and that opportunity. Knowing this first, that there shall, be, there shall come in the last days, scoffers, know that. So that it's not everybody carrying the Bible. It's not everybody talking to you. You will just run after. This is the first thing to know. False prophets will come in the last days. False teachers will come in the last days. And some people will depart from the faith in the last days. Know that false. And some scoffers will come. Some people that are very clever in putting forth arguments will come. Know this false. And you recognize that those offers and those deceivers are walking in a sinful way. Here is, look at second, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 
First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Some shall depart from the faith, and they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That is, they, you, know this first, know this first, know this first. You can keep on doing something wrong, doing something wrong, doing something wrong, and do that thing repeatedly so much, it hardens your conscience. And you are no more open to the voice of the Spirit of God. And you will think that all those other people that easily feel guilty, they easily feel condemned, whenever they do something, you know, these small, small things they do, and they are feeling guilty. So what's the matter with them? They are not strong-minded. Oh, it's not that you are strong-minded. It's because the devil has used the hot iron to sear your conscience. That's it. When you do something wrong, and you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, until it doesn't bother your conscience anymore, the devil is trying to seal your doom. He's trying to put a rope on your neck and drag you to eternal perdition and hellfire. The things you used to do, you'll feel guilty. You'll feel tender. You'll feel soft. You'll feel condemned. You'll be shaking and trembling. You will lose appetite. If you have done it over and over and over and over. And it doesn't touch your conscience anymore. Oh, we know that. Knowing this first. That in the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, having conscience seared, with a hot iron. And even if you hear Charles Finney preach, won't touch you. Wesley may come back and preach, won't bother you. And the conscience and the heart is so hard. Don't you know when things happen like that? And your conscience is like that today, knowing this first, that this is what will happen in the last days. You better be very careful. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Look up here. I thank God that God has helped us in this church. That even though there are people that will try to shut our mouth and tell us don't say that again. But because we fear God more than we fear you. Because we know that when the final time comes and God brings judgment, the judgment of God is greater than whatever pressure, whatever punishment any human being can put on any man. Whenever we encourage children to be obedient to their parents, there are some people that will deliberately Take delight in going to those children and saying, don't listen to that. The teenagers and the youths of today are not like the teenagers of 50 years ago. That obedience to parents, that's of 50, 40 years ago. Today, here is how young people do it. And whenever we tell young people that they should be obedient to the leadership in the church, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is the first commandment with promise. That your days may be long on the earth and that it may be well with you. Whenever we emphasize that to children in the church, there are some people that will go and teach those children deliberately because that preacher said that yesterday. You do this and disobey that pastor. So that... When he realizes that the more he says it, the more you young people rebel, eventually he will give up and say, there is no way in this. You cannot preach this anymore because the more you preach it, the more you emphasize it, the more some adults are putting fire and fuel in the engine of these energetic young people to disobey leadership in the church, their parents and the Lord. Is the spirit of the last days that comes upon such adults and such young people. Look at it. 
It says, for men in the last days shall be lovers of themselves, their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent fears, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady. Do you know that stubbornness, rebellion, headiness is a sign of the last days? High-minded. Then it goes on. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Heady. High-minded. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying the part thereof. From such. Tell me out loud. Ah, are they not the people you befriend? The people that said, I went to the pastor, he counseled me this way, but I am not going to obey what he said. Are, not, are they not the people you befriend? The people that I had his preaching, I had what he said, but I'm not going to do that. Are they not the people you befriend? Are they not your close confidence? But it said from such, turn away. You need to recognize the sinful work of the scoffers, of the doubters, of the backsliders, of the apostates, of, of the unbelievers, and avoid them. In 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, Reading from verse 18 to 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. All the apostle is saying here, you know, sometimes they say uh, it's because there's no love. That's why the people are leaving. But John, this is the apostle of love. And even though he was the apostle of love, there were still people that left. And he even became antichrists. And it says they went out from us, but they were not of us. What it means is before they left physically, they had led in their mind. They had started questioning the emphasis of the word of God. Before they left, while they were still here, physically, they had started saying, Holy, this holiness, holiness. They had started saying, this rapture, rapture. This is waiting for the coming of the Lord. Waiting for the coming of the Lord. Be heavenly minded. And here we have needs that are not satisfied. They had started grumbling, murmuring before they left. They were coming physically and they were sitting down like you are sitting down today. But in their mind, they had left. That's why it says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. In verse 26, in verse 26 it says, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, the people that will deceive you and seduce you. In Jude verses 18 and 19. Jude 18 and 19. How that they told you, that is the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, there should be mockers, scoffers. In the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lost? These be they who separate themselves. But you'll watch out when they separate themselves. They are sensual, having not the spirit. The spirit of God is not directing or controlling them anymore. That's the reason you need to be very careful of those coffers. In Second Timothy, after they've gone out, what they now do is that they try to overthrow the faith of other people. They then begin to introduce error to the people that are still standing. And uh, when you meet them, before you challenge them to say, ah, brother, sister, what happened? I, I even wanted to see you. Where I got a particular place, I'm telling you, in that place, those people can pray. You know, uh, didn't I get to deeper life before you? I know all of deeper life. I know doctrine from A to Z. I, I've been in Congress. I've been in retreat. I've been in seminar. I've been in whatever it is. I've even, you know, once in a while, been given opportunity to even preach also. Even in those big, big meetings. But I'm telling you, I got a place now. Those people can pray. Those people can pray. 
I spent, you know, since I left, I spent just one week, two weeks, and you know, those people prayed. I was challenged, I was revived. I have new hope now that that thing I'm looking for that I didn't get in deeper life all this, I'm going to get it now. Come and see it for yourself. Don't go and see. That's how they talk. They want to overthrow your own face because they have gone away from the root and from the foundation. That's why they're inviting you. Look at it in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 16. But shun, profane, and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their words will eat as doth a canker. What that means is that they would say, well, you may not know this one, but Open your ears very well. You just go to deeper life. You just go to church. What do you know? We are the people that are close to that pastor. We know him. We know his family. We know his children. Open your ears. If you know this, 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 you know, remember, their conscience is not seared with a hot iron. They can tell lies without batting an eye. Without winking, without blinking. They will say, if I tell you about his wife, uh -uh. I'm close to those people. About the children, if I tell you a story, and they are what? As they pump it and they inject that poison into you. Although you were still coming for some time, but while you are sitting there, you'll be remembering the word that eats like a canker in your heart. You won't concentrate. You'll be remembering the place you were standing and the clothes that man was wearing and the garment that lady was wearing when telling you that thing. Their word will each as does a canker. Look at it in verse, in verse 17. Of whom is Admenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already and they overthrow the faith of some. I pray they will not overthrow your faith. But you see, that's what these people do. That's why the apostle is telling us, know this first, that this is what will come in the last days. And we're telling you all this so that nobody will take your crown from you. I come to point number three. Reject the subtle wiles of the scoffers. Reject the subtle wiles of the scoffers. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You need to recognize that these are deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And you need to recognize that all their lies that may be cleverly presented, if you don't reject them, you'll find that those deceptive arguments will sweep, sweep you off your feet. As Satan deceived Eve and caused the human race to fall by starting with a question to cause doubt in the heart. So these coffers and apostles of Satan, they start with a question. Where is the promise of his coming? For them it may be, where is the promise of what they are saying? Where is the testimony, the evidence of the testimony of what God is doing? Where is the evidence that, you know, God is there in fullness? Where is the evidence that we have the whole truth? Where is the evidence that uh, we are standing firm on the word of God? Where is the evidence that even the holiness sanctification they are talking about? Where is the evidence that their leader and the family is sanctified and holy? Where is the evidence that this, where is the evidence that that? They will come with questions. Because this is what the scoffers did and they were saying, where is the promise of his coming? And then now they will not allow the people to even answer the question. Just like Satan did in asking Eve a question. Has God said? And while Eve was, you know, still saying what she was saying, then the devil through the serpent said, ah, it is this, it is this, it is this. And before Eve could recollect herself, she was backsliding, she was falling. Then they will answer and say, because for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That's why you need to be very careful so that nobody, by their cleverness, by their sugar-coated mouth, by their false information, will get you off your feet. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 15. 
Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 15. Here are the scoffers. Behold, they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? They were telling Jeremiah, Where is the word of the Lord? It's a question of the scoffer. And then in Ezekiel chapter 12. Ezekiel chapter 12 from verse 21. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is this? What is that proverb? that ye have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth. That is, the people were saying, The days are prolonged. And this vision, and this prophecy, and uh, this sin that they are saying, the revelation, it's failing. Tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, to stop. And they shall no more you see it as a proverb in Israel, but say unto them, The days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. For there shall be no more any vain vision of flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord. I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. God's word will come to pass. Amen. It shall be no more prolonged, for in your days, so rebellious house, will I say the word and will perform it, says the Lord God. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, The vision that he seeth is for men any days to come, and he prophesies of the times that are far off. Therefore say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged anymore, but the word which I, sh I have spoken shall be done, says the Lord God. You see, as the people are saying, The Lord, he prolongs, he delays his coming. He is not coming now. He is not coming now. Let me go and do whatever I need to do. Then the Lord says, He is coming, and he will soon come. In Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition rejects. A man that is an heretic, if a person comes to you and uh, he's telling you something and you say, my brother, you know, I'm a young person. I am... I'm not as intelligent as you are. Have you gone to our leaders? Yes, I went to coordinator and I wasn't satisfied. Did you do any other? I went to group coordinator. I even saw one overseer. And they explained to you, yes. Why didn't you then make attempt to see our pastor, our father in the Lord, the GS? Oh, I saw him. And did you discuss these points? I'm telling you. I, you know me? I spoke to that man. What did he say? He tried to explain. He quoted Bible, quoted Bible. And what was your response? Oh, I wasn't satisfied. Ah, a person like that, who has seen all of us, and we read Bible, and he wasn't satisfied. Are you the one that will be able to combat that person? He will take you away into his corruption and deception. A man that is an heretic, Look at it in verse 10. It's an heretic after the first and the second admonition. Reject. Go your way and let him go his way. Because if you stay there and you say you are trying to convince him, he will convince you and you will backslide. And it's better to lose one person than to lose the two of you. Then in verse 11 it says, Knowing that he that is such is subverted already and seen is being condemned of himself. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, and you know these people, the scoffers, the unbelievers, the doubters, uh, they say, after all, with all the things, uh, if, if I am wrong, with all the things I've done, and they're saying that this is wrong and this is wrong, I've done it and no judgment has come. That's how they think. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, Reading from verse 11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Because the judgment has not come. If, if what I'm doing is wrong, why didn't God strike me dead? If what I'm doing is wrong, why didn't God give me sickness? If what I'm doing is wrong, why am I still healthy and strong and I'm still moving about and I'm prospering? Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. But listen to this, though a sinner do evil and hundred times 
and his days be prolonged. Yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God. Which fear before him? But it shall not be well with the wicked. Neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. In Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 17, from verse 26 to verse 32, Luke 17, from verse 26, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat and they drank and they married wives and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat and they drank and they bought and they sold and they planted and they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom. It rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he that he which be upon the housetop and is top in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Everybody read verse 32 for yourself out loud. Remember Lord's wife. Remember, remember Lord's wife. Just looking back, remember Lord's wife. I pray that you will be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Uh, you know, brothers and sisters, a teaching like this, um, it takes uh, somebody that God has appointed, anointed, approved to teach something like this. Because this is not a teaching of excitement and joy and you know some people don't even like to hear something like this they don't like the father gathering his children together and talking to them and warning them about the world and about the deception in the world and about how some people are waiting out there to destroy their lives uh, children want their parents to tell them exciting stories and joyful things and after that sing together and have a nice time together. And sometimes church is like that. Church likes when we come together and we read the promises of God and we're excited and we sing choruses and we clap our hands and we rejoice and then we come out of church we we'll say, I enjoyed church today. It was wonderful. In fact, the pastor was so loving and so kind and prayed for everybody. I was, so, I like every service and every sermon and every Bible study to be like that. You know, we're just happy and we forgot that, you know, there was any problem before. We forgot anybody that left, anybody that stayed. We just were excited. There are times where we have to get together and warn ourselves. And Jesus did that too. In Matthew chapter 24, it wasn't an exciting meeting, a joyful meeting. It wasn't jubilation and celebration. He was warning them, be careful. False prophets will come. False Christ will come. There will be war. There will be rumors of wars. And there will be deception everywhere. There will even be false miracles. And there will be great signs and wonders that if it were possible, they will deceive the very elect. And there will be a great tribulation. And after the great tribulation of those days, then the Son of Man shall come in the clouds. And the the sun shall be turned into blood and the moon also shall be darkened and all the elements of the of the sky everything will be falling down and if the days were not shortened nobody shall be saved when jesus was saying that it wasn't a chorus singing excitement jubilation celebration this is the kind of meeting we are today but it's necessary so that you'll be prepared when the lord will come i pray you'll be prepared what joy it will be. What joy it will be for all of us that have listened to this message today. And because of this message, when the scoffers come, when the doubters come, when the unbelievers come, when the apostates come, when the false prophets come, when the false teachers come, when the unbelievers come, when the people that are doubting their certainty of the coming of the Lord, when they come to you, you will recognize and you will reject. You will say, please hold it. Don't say that to me. I'm on my way to heaven. I've made up my mind. Nobody will turn me back. So that when the Lord 
not welcome, I will be ready. I know if there is only one person that is going to be ready, I've made up my mind. Let everybody go back if they want, but my eyes are focused on Canaan. Everybody, anybody, they may go back to Egypt, but like Caleb, like Joshua, I'm making up my mind, that land of promise, I will reach there. That land of promise, I will reach there. Are you making up your mind today that no, man, no matter the mixed multitude, no matter the ten spies, no matter all the other Israelites, they may go back and they may say they are not going to the promised land anymore but you make up your mind as for me and my house i will serve the lord that land of promise i will be there that land of promise i will be there that land of promise i will be there i will not allow any deceiver i will not allow any scoffer i will not allow any backslider i will not allow anybody to deceive me many people may go back many people may go back many people may go back i'm making up my mind even as they are going back i am standing i am staying i'm going to stay with the lord until the end of time until the lord will come until the lord will come and take his people home and i'm making up my mind i'll be one of them 